All right, brethren, let's go to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at one verse. Paul says in verse 20, Philippians 4.20, Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to the Lord. Our God and our Father, we do pray this morning that you would get all the glory. Pray that your Son would be honored and you be honored in Him. Lord, settle our hearts. Make us to have our affection and our attention set on nothing but the gospel. Make us hear, make us understand, Lord, and give us faith to believe. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Our subject's glory to God our Father. Every child of God who is saved by grace, who's experienced the grace of God and knows full well by experience that salvation must be by grace, that salvation is entirely by grace, this is our confession. This is our desire, our testimony. Now, now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. What is it to glory only in God and our Father? What is that? What is it to glory only in God? Christ teaches us to glory in the Lord. He gloried only in his Father. Gave all glory to his Father. Everything he thought, said, and did. And he teaches us to do it. Let's go to Psalm 34. He said, you know, he said, uh, I will sing praises unto thee in the midst of the congregation. And Christ teaches us. He not only glorified the Father, but he teaches his children, his brethren in the house, how to glorify the Father. This is David is saying this, he taught David this, but it's really the words of our Lord Jesus. And he said in Psalm 34, 1, this is, this is what it is to glorify God and our Father. He said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, praise of him, shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Now let's look at this right here, just what he said, and let's learn a few things from this, these two verses in Psalm 34. One, to glory in God and our Father is to glory in Him alone, is to praise Him alone. He said, I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. Paul said, now to God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. We don't give glory to God if we give ourselves credit for even one work in salvation. We cease giving God the glory at all if we give ourselves credit for one work in salvation. Paul told the Galatians, if you be circumcised, if you do that one work, you're better to do all the work. Keep the whole law of God. To give God our Father glory is to give Him all the glory, all the praise for every aspect of salvation. Everything about God the Father chose His people in Christ, not based on anything in us, by grace. God the Father loved His people in Christ even when we fell in Adam. And when we didn't love him because of our sin, he still loved us in Christ. God our Father gave his only begotten son the propitiation for our sin. Just, just sit and think about that. We were ungodly. We didn't love God. We hated God. It just wasn't that we didn't have a good opinion of God and didn't love him. We hated him. We were at the other end of the scale. 
And God loved his people and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God the Father raised all his elect in Christ. When Christ had finished the work of redemption, he raised all his elect in Christ, raised us up together in him, and made us sit down together in him at his right hand. And God our Father then sent the gospel to us and sent the Holy Spirit to us and revealed what he had done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ and gave us faith and repentance to stop looking to our vain works and to believe him. He did that for us. And God the Father accepts his people in the beloved. He accepts his saints in the beloved and he's preserving us in Christ Jesus and will one day fully receive us into glory entirely due to what Christ has done for us. You see why Paul said, Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Secondly, not only is it to give God all the glory, but to glory in God and our Father is to glory in Him at all times. At all times. In verse 1, Psalm 34, 1, He said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That means in happy times or sad times, good times or bad times, on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ bore shame. He bore the shame of his people's sin. He bore our sin and he bore the shame of that sin. He felt that shame. He felt it. And he bore sorrow like nobody else ever bore. Talk about a bad time. Talk about a sorrowful time. Never been one like it. He's preeminent in everything. He said, is there any sorrow like unto my sorrow? He's preeminent in everything, even in sorrow. Is there any sorrow like unto my sorrow? Listen, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. Somebody will come under some painful providence and men will look at him and say, oh, the Lord's afflicting him. If somebody ever says that about you, child of God, you remember this, the Lord only chastens those he loves. <laughs> they, they might say that meaning to, to condemn you, but you can say, thank you for reminding me of that. My father sent this. Christ knew it was God who judged him. He knew it was God who afflicted him. He didn't look at just those men that afflicted him. He knew the Father was, was behind it all and working it. And Christ, but Christ justified his Father. He justified God. He declared Psalm 22, I am a worm and no man. That's what the Son of God said from the cross. After he said, my God, my, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He vindicated God for doing, pouring out wrath on him. He said, I am a worm and no man, and thou art holy. He justified God for the affliction. You know what God's child's going to do in affliction? He's going to justify God. God's going to give you grace to say what Michael said. I'll bear the indignation of the Lord because I've sinned against you. And at the same time, trust and glorify God, but he will plead my cause. He will draw me to the light, to Christ my light, and he'll make me behold his righteousness. That's what Christ, Christ glorified God on the cross more than anybody ever glorified the Father. Preeminently, perfectly, he glorified the Father on the cross. Trust in the Father the whole time. Let's go over to Psalm 22. I want you to see this. Listen to what he said. Psalm 22. Verse 
You see there in verse 2, he cried, Oh my, verse 1, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Verse 3, he said, But thou art holy. Verse 6, he said, But I'm a worm and no man. But look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he'd deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in it. That, you know who that is? That's sinners who, who were as lost and blind as you once were. Just throwing it in his teeth. But look what Christ did. Here's how he glorified the Father. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. Look at verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. You know what he's doing? He, he's, he's perfectly honoring and glorifying the Father as being faithful to his covenant promise. He had promised the Son that when he satisfied justice, God would deliver him. God would justify him. And he's saying what he said in Isaiah 50. In Isaiah 50 verse 7, he said, the reason he gave his back to, his, to the smiters was this, for the Lord God will help me. He said, therefore I shall not be confounded. I won't be ashamed for trusting my Father. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint. I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. You do see the, how he's glorifying the Father? He's glorifying God's justice. He's glorifying him for being righteous. He's bearing what he's bearing on the cross to manifest that God's righteous. And as he's bearing the curse and putting away the sin of his people and justifying his people, he's trusting the Father to justify him. He said, who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who's my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? You see, to glorify God Go back to Philippians 4. To glorify God is to do all these things that we saw before that Paul told us to do at all times. Look here. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. See that? Christ is on the cross and he's rejoicing in the Father the whole time. Rejoice in the Lord even when you're bearing a cross. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation, your patience, your long-suffering, your, your forbearance just Bearing it patiently. Let it be known to all men, knowing this, the Lord's at hand. That's what Christ was doing on the cross for his people. Be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You see Christ doing that on the cross? He was calling to the Father saying, Lord, help me. And the peace of God which passes all understanding to keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. You see, when we're murmuring and when we're complaining about God's providence and about the suffering, and when we're, we're not believing God when we're doing that, and we're not glorifying God when we do that, God's working it. And to, for me to complain about anything God works in my life, no matter how painful it is, is to say, God, I don't think you're doing a very good job. That's not glorifying to God. But to, but to rejoice in him, even in the suffering, to know the Lord's at hand, to make your request be known to him, to trust Him, that's glorifying to Him. That's glorifying His faithfulness and His righteousness. That's what Christ did on the cross. He gave God the glory by trusting in Him. And you know what? God the Father, faithful, righteous, He honored that faith. He honored that trust Christ had in Him. Look here, back in Psalm 34, 3. He said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Glorify him with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. 
Verse 6, he said, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. So to glorify God is to glorify him alone. To glorify him is to glorify him at all times, continually, even when we're suffering, painful suffering. And thirdly, Psalm 34, to glorify him, God and our fathers to do so from the new heart in spirit. He said in verse 2, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. My soul. God looks on the heart. Christ glorified God the Father with a perfect heart and he did it in perfection. He did that for his people. We believe and worship God in the new spirit that God's created within us. And God's looking on the heart. Those Christ redeemed, those born again of the Holy Spirit, are given a pure, holy heart by God, undefiled, that'll never be corrupted, born of incorruptible seed. And it's in that new heart that we give God all the glory. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. That's why the Lord said, you know, when you're fasting, when you're, and a true fast is when you're so heartbroken that you can't eat, you're not interested in earthly food, you're just wanting the heavenly manna. And he said, but when you're in that state, he said, don't put on a sad countenance outwardly. Don't, no, that's just to make other men see that you're sorrowing and that you're in trial and affliction, and that's just glory in one man, glory in another man. He said, clean your face up, put on a Put on a good countenance. In your heart, in your heart, glorify him and praise him and trust him and look to him. In your heart. In the heart. Fourthly, Psalm 34, 2, to give God our Father the glory, here's what it really is. It's to boast in him. <laughs> It's to boast in him. He said in verse 2, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Make her boast in the Lord. We have no reason whatsoever to boast in ourselves. We don't have any reason whatsoever to boast in ourselves. And here's why. Nothing's of us. <laughs> Nothing about salvation is of us. Nothing. Christ said, without me, what? You can do nothing. But we have every reason to boast in God our Father because everything in salvation is of Him. Romans eleven thirty six says, for of Him and through Him and to Him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. What about spiritual life? Here we were dead. What can a dead man do? We couldn't do a thing. Christ said we must be born again of God the Holy Spirit. And he sent the Holy Spirit and he gave us spiritual life. He gifted us with life that we did not have. He said in John 1.12, John said as many as received him, to, to them gave he the power, the privilege to become the sons of God, even to, to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What about faith? Everybody, men in, in this world and religion, they've turned faith into their idol. Faith's their God. At least I've got my faith. Well, my faith got me through. My faith, my faith, my faith. Where'd you get your faith? Who sustains your faith? By grace are you saved through faith. And that's not of yourself. It's the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. We saw in one of the Psalms just here recently, God sustains our faith. What about righteousness? You've got to be perfectly righteous to be accepted of God. These, these filthy, dirty hands can't have a part in that. We'd boast. We'd boast in ourselves. What did Paul say? Let me read this to you. Paul said, 
he said, talk about men constraining others to do what they think they are to do and all the things they do in religion. He said, Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The cross is everything. Not, not that wooden structure, Christ on the cross. Christ, what he accomplished on the cross. He's the righteousness of his people. Paul said, I want to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faithfulness of my Lord Jesus Christ, that which was imputed to me freely through God-given faith. I want to be found in his righteousness. What about holiness and good works? Boy, this is where men go off the rails right here. I tell you, I've searched these scriptures. I've looked, I've listened to what men have said in the past on sanctification and holiness. And I've looked up the scriptures they use to try to support what they say. It don't support what men say. It wouldn't hold up in a court of law, not in an earthly court of law. It sure won't hold up before God. Holiness and good works are of God. It's of God. It's of Christ Jesus our Lord. Scripture says we are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works and even concerning those good works. God already before ordained that we shall walk in them and He gives you the grace to walk in them. It's God which worketh in you both the will and the do of His good pleasure. The good works and things that most men call holiness and, and what men use to gauge how much they've grown in holiness are just the result of what Christ did in God's people. And people that look to those works, most of them, it ain't the result of what Christ did. Even in Peter, when he got up from that table sitting at the Gentiles, went over and sat at the Jews, Paul said, if we who claim to be saved from the dominion of sin and justified in Christ Jesus, if we turn again in sin, did Christ work that? And he was talking about Peter getting up from that one table and going over to that other table. He said, no, Christ didn't work that. If men are looking to themselves and boasting their works and calling that holiness, Christ didn't work that. Because Christ, when he's truly sanctified you, here's what he does. Christ is formed in the heart, a new man's created of the Spirit of God, which makes you for the first time be able to see Christ by his will, performing the will of God for me, according to Hebrews 10, by his will he has sanctified his people by his one offering on the cross. And see, it's this inward sanctification that makes you behold your sanctification is the Lord Jesus Christ. You're holy in Christ. You've been made fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. It'll get more fit than that. And these things he's working in our lives as we go through this world is him teaching us more and more. He's our holiness. Yes, it makes you want to walk after God godliness and makes you want to do good works it makes you follow him more and more but it also makes you not put any confidence in those works <laughs> because you see more and more my only sanctification is Christ and he's my only sanctifier keeping me partaking of his holiness unto God and our father be glory forever and ever amen that's what we're saying who maketh thee to differ from another what do you have that you didn't receive? Some men think that word receive means what do I have that I didn't go ahead and accept from God? That's not what it means. I mean, what do you have that he didn't give you and make you willing to receive? If you did receive it, my glory is if you didn't receive it. If I start saying my works count for something, and I'll tell you this, I know men will say, well, I'm not justified by my works and I'm not made holy by my works. 
But be careful because if you're not careful, you're saying, but my works count. Christ's works count. But Christ's work counts. And what Christ's work is the only thing that counts. Why glory is if you didn't receive as if you weren't freely given everything he worked in you. Why does God save this way? Why does he save the way he saves? Go to 1 Corinthians 1.29. Here's why he saves the way he saves. He uses a foolish gospel. He uses foolish men who aren't impressive. Preaches a bloody cross that's foolishness to men. Preaches everything about our gospel and the way God saves is foolish to natural man. But here's why he saves this way. Verse 29, that no flesh shall glory in his presence, but of him, of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God, Christ of God, is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. That's holiness. Same word translated to other places, holiness and redemption, that according as it's written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. He's quoting from Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the Lord said, don't let the rich man glory in his riches. Don't let the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let him that glory, glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That's what God said. I'm the Lord which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. He's the one that does that. In these things I delight, saith the Lord. Be sure to get this now. Only those saved by God and our Father alone from beginning to end glory in God our Father alone. The only ones that do. Those who claim to believe on Christ by their own will, they're glorying in their will. They're not glorying in the Father. They're not glorying in Him who blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places according as He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. They're saying, I chose, I chose, it's my will. Mm -mm. Salvation is by God's will, by God's choice. Those who claim righteousness or holiness by their works, people in, people in, that, that, those, those Judaizers that came down there demanding that believers had to be circumcised or they couldn't be saved, they weren't saying you're justified by your works. They weren't saying you made holy by your works. They simply were saying, but except you be circumcised, you can't be saved. <laughs> Peter said, no. He said, except us Jews are saved like those Gentiles that don't have the law. We can't be saved by grace, by grace, by God's works. To glory in God and our fathers, to boast, is to brag on God and what God's done. That's what the preaching of the gospel is. I come here to this place to brag on my God and tell you what he's done. He's salvation. Now, sixthly, back in Philippians 4, this is something that's very important too. Very, very important. To glory in God and our Father is to glory in what He has worked in our brethren. Now get that. To glory in Him is to glory in the good He's worked in our brethren. Now look here in verse 8. Philippians 4, 8. We saw this. When Paul said, Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true, what serve things are honest? What serve things are just? What serve things are pure? What serve things are lovely? What serve things are of good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And now he said the same thing in Philippians uh, uh, 2. You know, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels of mercies, feel ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love of one accord, of one of mind. Let nothing be through, done through strife or vain glory. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than ourselves. That's what he's saying here. Now listen, if you mark a brother's sins, 
or you just pay attention and keep focusing on their shortcomings. And in your heart, you're critical of it. Or you murmur about it to somebody else, what they don't do. You're critical of God's workmanship. Now get that. Critical of God's workmanship. Paul's telling us, beholding your brethren the good that God has worked in them. Look for the good, whatsoever things. Look for the good and give God the glory because they're God's workmanship. Christ, Ephesians 4 said, Christ gives measure. He gives a measure of grace to each of his people. He said, some bear, you know, Oh, this much fruit, some bear this much fruit, some bear this much fruit. Not all bear the same fruit. Not all are at the same level in grace, in growth. Just like if you look at people in this room right here, not everybody's at the same level in growth, just physically. Well, it's the same spiritually. But everybody in the kingdom of God, in the house of God, they are where they are by the measure of grace Christ has given to them. And so if I'm going to be critical of their shortcomings, that's like, now how would you like this? How would you like somebody looking at you as a parent and being critical of what your child don't do? You'd say, well, that, that would offend me. Well, to be critical of somebody that Christ is the master of, that Christ is growing, that Christ is giving grace to, that he is from the head, all nourishment is ministered, to be critical of that child is to criticize Christ's workmanship. What if you, what if you uh, were a musician and you played a great piece of music and, and somebody criticized the music? Or, or more exact to the illustration, or better illustration, what if you taught somebody how to play? Taught your child how to play an instrument. And they hit, struck a few bad notes, you know, as they're playing. And somebody said, your child's not a very good musician. I heard those bad notes they played. They didn't hear any of the good notes. <laughs> Just heard the bad notes. That's to criticize somebody, criticize you and what you taught them. Well, the same with the Lord. One time somebody told Brother Henry, they were offended at something he said in a message. He said, what I say before that? They said, I don't know. He said, what I say after that? They said, I don't know. He said, well, I'm glad I said that or you wouldn't have got a thing out of it. That probably offended that person. But you know what? It's just what they needed to hear. Just what they needed to hear. You give God our Father the glory for the good he's worked in your brethren. You look for the good Look for the good. You know what it'll do? It'll do you good. <laughs> it'll get you out of that negative space. It'll get you knowing God's doing all things well. That's what Paul said. And the peace of God will keep your heart and mind. You want to have the peace of God? Stop doing everything in your world to grieve the Holy Spirit. Fight against it by criticizing others. Glorify God for what he's worked in your brethren. Lastly, in all this, to glorify God and our Father is to glory only in His Son, Christ Jesus, our Savior, because the Father trusted the whole work to the Son, and everything is done, it's being done by the Son. He's the head. He said, I and my Father are one. He said, He that honors not the Son, honors not the Father that sent Him. So believing on Christ, giving Christ all the glory, Glory in what he's worked in my brethren. Glory in his providence, what he's sent. Trust in him. he's at hand. All these things we've been seeing, boasting, bragging in him, doing it at all times. To do that toward the Son is to do it to the Father. Give him all the glory. We're glorying in his name. Now listen, you know, I know I give you these names from time to time, but they're so. this is the name of the Lord. We're saved by the name of the Lord. And I want you to think about this. This is everything you need. And there's more names of the Lord than just these in the scripture. But listen to these names of our Lord. He's Jehovah Hasenu, the Lord our maker. 
He's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. Everything you need, he is. This is Christ. He's Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. We preach one gospel. We raise one banner. When Moses held up the banner, the children of Israel prevailed. When his arms got weak and he dropped the banner, the Amalekites prevailed. It's through this banner, through this gospel, through this flag we're flying. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Jehovah Rhea, the Lord our shepherd. He's leading us the whole way. He goes before us and behind us, he said. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Um Kadesh, the Lord that doth sanctify you. No, there's no synergism there. There's no co-effort there between you and him. He's just the Lord that sanctified to you. He does it. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. Jehovah Jesus, the Lord our Savior. His name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. You see, everything we need is what he is. What he is is everything we need. Those in whom God's revealed his Son, here's the fact of the matter. They will glory in the Son. They will do all these things I've been preaching to you. How do you know? Because God said in Isaiah 45, 25, In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified, and in the Lord shall all the seed of Israel glory. <laughs> They're going to glory in Him. God said, Everybody's called by my name. I created Him for my glory. I formed him. I made him to give me all the glory. He said, let them shout for joy. Let them be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. So each of God's sake say from the heart, now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's what, that's, and, and Paul said, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Let's go to him. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We pray you bless it. Thank you, Lord. And we, we pray you have all the glory. Make us to glorify you in all our thoughts, our words, our deeds. And Lord, glorify yourself in us. We thank you for your Son. Thank you for all the works being in his hand, and we pray, Lord, that you'd make us glorify him continually. And forgive us, Lord, for failing. We fail so miserably to glorify you alone. Help us to do so, Lord. Help us to never, never, never glory in ourselves. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.